My guest today on In the Credits is legendary special effects artist Ray Harryhausen, whose new book, An Animated Life, has just been released to unanimous praise. For those of you who may not be familiar with Mr. Harryhausen's incredible career, we have prepared a short montage of clips. Enjoy. <laughs> Ray, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Well, and thank I'm you. I'm very glad you were able to make it. Having a new book on the market must be incredible for you. You had a book years ago, back in the 70s. Yes, I did. It was called Film Found as a mm -hmm. Scrapbook. Mm -hmm. But that was more a resume and pictures. I wanted it to be a picture book rather than a, right. a book of uh, words, shall we say. And, uh, but this book, the new book, is much more complicated. It goes into depth mm -hmm. into how things were done up to a point. That's right. I remember finding that book, the first one, Film Fantasy Scrapbook, on a shelf in Hollywood. And like many of your fans, I was thrilled to see anything by you because we knew you didn't give away too many secrets. Today, that's an entirely different situation. You know, Cinefax and other magazines give away all the secrets, but I know that's nothing. the trouble. It's they really give away, and before the picture comes out, they tell you how it's done. That's right. And I think that takes half the uh, charm of the film mm -hmm. away. I know when I saw King Kong in 1933 for the first time, uh, I was amazed at, uh, that I didn't know how it was done. Yeah. And that's half the charm of a film. Why tell everything? And that's what I kept, everybody thought I was being coy, but. I wasn't. Uh, I just felt that if a magician tells you how a rabbit is pulled out of the hat, mm -hmm. you're no longer interested. That's right. And I think Willis O'Brien probably taught you that lesson, too. When you went to visit Willis, didn't you get a sense that he was not necessarily giving away too much information? You were thrilled to meet him, but he didn't want to give you too much information at the time for the same reason. It's yes, not... I suppose so. But uh, when you do publicity for the film, uh, I think that's a, a little different matter than mm -hmm. if you're having some personal person yeah. in, involved in the whole situation. You mentioned King Kong, which was done by Willis O'Brien, a classic film. Everybody growing up in the 50s particularly saw it on the big screen. It was released twice during the 50s. 
And of course, you saw it when it was first released in 1933, and it had an incredible impact on you at Grauman's Chinese, of all places, one of the wonderful theaters of the world. Yes. It still is, but it, at that time, it was even more wonderful because they had stage shows and they had entertainment to accompany the film. You were 13. Tell us your reaction to that movie when you went in there. Well, it was awesome because I didn't. I knew it was about a gorilla, but uh, you'd seen pictures in the paper of uh, okay. the posters. But I, I, I didn't know. The, the, the whole atmosphere was different than today. Sid Grauman was a wonderful showman, and he used to have uh, stage shows before the, the key feature came on, an hour show. They had uh, dancers and uh, acrobats. They even had a trapeze artist come down <laughs> over the audience Fantastic. and perform. Uh, in a native, they kept it in a native uh, type of uh, backgrounds to fit with the picture. But uh, then, uh, of course, when you entered the theater out in the lobby, they had the big bust of Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was operated by compressed air, and you had it moving, and its eyes going up and down, and pink flamingos wandering <laughs> around in the front. It's hard to imagine. And the that. trees, you know, hide, as though he were looking over the trees. And it, it was something you never forget. And but you were, today, they uh, don't do that anymore. You were so taken by that film that you've said on many occasions, almost any time you're interviewed, you say it changed your life forever, and I, I can see why it would have. Well, it, was it certainly spectacular. did. Yeah. It wasn't just a technical virtuosity, it was the way the story was constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a Depression times in the 30s, and uh, they took you by the hand from the Depression era into the most outrageous fantasy that's ever been put on right. the screen. Now, when you first <laughs> saw that, of course, you didn't know how... King Kong or the dinosaurs had been created or animated, and there wasn't anything available for research. Today, anybody going into the film industry can go to the Academy Library or to most bookshops and find a magazine that talks about movies, but you were completely alone there. You I had, know. There were no books out nothing. at the time. No technical uh, terms. And they, they, there was a... A, a strange article in Popular Mechanics that showed a, a great big mechanical gorilla with cables coming out of its heels and a little man in the corner with an organ, <laughs> and that was supposed to have made the, the, the creature move. I c didn't believe that for an instant. No. But I, I did feel that... Uh, then Look Magazine... <coughs> pardon me. A Look Magazine came out showing Fay Ray shaking hands with King Kong, mm -hmm. and she was big and Kong was small. Right. So that started to give it away, and then my father met a man who had worked at RKO and told me all about right. stop motion. And there I was hooked. There you I began. had to yeah. try an experiment on my own. And what was your first experiment? You were only, how old? You were 13 or 14 when you started <coughs> I was the still in high school. Still in high school, think, probably yeah. a junior in high school or so. What did you first experiment with? Just as, you had a camera. You had a stop motion camera, or you had a camera that allowed you to do frame no, at a time? No, I didn't have a, I borrowed a camera, mm. an old Victor camera mm. from a friend of mine. And one night we uh, uh, set up this cave scene with a cave bear, was one of my first animated models that had a wooden armature with ball and socket right, joint, right. but it would ratchet and uh, the Victor camera didn't have a one frame shaft. So you had to hope you got one frame by tapping it. Uh -huh. And sometimes you got two, sometimes you got three, sometimes you didn't get any. So uh, uh, when the film came back, it was quite uh, jerky, shall we say. <laughs> but I, nevertheless, it still intrigued me that this thing was moving by itself on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's kept me going all these years, is a, maybe you'd call it a Zeus complex. And, of course, we understand that. <laughs> the I Greeks think, believed that yes. the gods uh, were simply big people like themselves controlling humanity, and I control my actors. They do exactly what I want them of to course. do. Of course, of course. And that's something that most directors would love to have. I, they would yeah. love to hear today, because a lot of times the actors seem to dictate the direction. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> a little bit later, after you began experimenting, you had the opportunity to meet Willis O'Brien, Yes, I did. And show him some of your work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, that would have been an incredible experience for anybody, but particularly for you because you were so in love with King Kong. 
This was after the film was reissued in 1938, or had was it in between the time you first saw it and on the, on the first reissue? It was in between the in between time I first saw it and the uh, initiation. Reissue. Because you could seldom find a, a replay of it mm -hmm. for quite a number of years. Yeah. And uh, it was always a thrill. And then, of course, when I met Forey Ackerman and Ray Bradbury, we right. had a similar interest in dinosaurs. Exactly. And we would call each other up and say, this picture's being replayed in Eagle Rock, and we'd jump on the red car and <laughs> go way out to Eagle Rock to see in a 10, uh, ten cent flea pit. That's you know? right. You paid 10 cents to see a replay. And uh, it was a lot of fun in those days. I think it's incredible that uh, when I was growing up and when you were growing up, slightly different era, but not much different, we had to wait for a film to be reissued. If at all, it might never get reissued if we missed it the first time. And at the very best we could hope for might be a television screening of it. And a lot of people catch up with films they missed in the theaters in those days by just waiting for the TV show. Nowadays, within a couple of months, there's a videotape or a DVD of a particular I film. Know. And I think some that, of the magic is taken out. It does. Yeah. It takes the magic. I know when I was growing up, my parents took me to see the silent films, mm -hmm. The Lost World, uh, yes. uh, Metropolis, and uh, uh, it was a great event on Saturday night to go to your local cinema and see the, the new film. Yeah. But today, you're inundated with entertainment and people are rather jaded about it, yeah. I think. You see it on television, you see it in the bars, you see it everywhere mm -hmm. on videos. Uh, so it's no longer a novelty, and I think that's rather uh, a shame because uh, I think the novelty of it all uh, was quite stimulating at mm -hmm. that time. And the technology is spectacular, but the drawback is with a DVD, for example, you can freeze frame and you can look at every little detail, which again removes the magic spell. I know, and that's the trouble. And you, you have fans who write and say, I ran your picture frame by frame and I see a pair of pliers in the <laughs> corner. <laughs> well, you'd never see no. that in the normal no. course of the film, but uh, they start looking for the seams mm -hmm. because I guess uh, there have been so many films out that it's uh, uh, no longer a novelty. No, it's a shame because uh, there are actually magazines which have columns featuring people who have found errors in films that that's have just correct. been released. And yeah. that's absolutely awful because what's the point for, for one thing, yeah. but it takes some of the fun out of it. If a film isn't good, you're going to know it without having somebody mm. point out errors in it. It's just not going to be enjoyable. Mm. But to have someone sit down frame by frame and find <laughs> that something here is missing or that they had a reverse angle that didn't fit or that the milk in one bottle is, is mm. more than it is, this, it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, well, after you met Willis O'Brien, <coughs> you had a chance to meet him because of a classmate. You had a chance to show Willis O'Brien some of your work. And what advice did he give you? You had recently won an award. We were just recently, you and I were at the museum in Los Angeles and you were talking yes, about Yes, I won an award. Won an award at the Natural History Museum. At the, uh, it was a junior, uh, they had a junior division at the, at the Exposition mm -hmm. Museum. And I won a second prize, I guess, a blue uh, Dalian, uh, and uh, Dahlia. And uh, uh, I was quite proud of my Stegosaurus, yeah. and I brought it along. I put it in a suitcase when Mr. O'Brien invited me to MGM to see all his preparation for war eagles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he looked at my Stegosaurus, and he, he said, it's all very nice model, but the legs look like sausages. <laughs> so he said, you better study anatomy. Mm -hmm. So I went back, and I did that study anatomy at night. Uh, and now some of my models look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Of course. <laughs> and they're not even uh, political. They just yes. But they, it is necessary to know anatomy. You've got to know so many different phases when you're working with models. Mm -hmm. It's different than the computer. And I'm always grateful that I took a course in acting because I, at one time I thought I wanted to tread the boards. <laughs> not realizing you get butterflies on opening <laughs> night. So I'm better off behind the camera. But it taught me how to make my characters act and react with actors. Yes, that's right. I've been with you on a number of occasions when aspiring filmmakers or artists have brought creations of their own. Yes. And 
now, since you and I have talked about this story with O'Brien where he told you that the legs look like sausages, I've been constantly aware of the musculature in the designs of the things that people bring to show you. Yes, very and much And so. I'm always looking to see if the legs look like sausages <laughs> or, or are they actually well representative yes. of, uh, of muscles. And that really is the, the mark of an artist. If the artist can create something that looks like it actually might walk off yes. the table. That's, yeah. uh, you try to convince, you know it's not real. When I sat through King Kong for the first time, I knew it wasn't real, but I didn't know how it was done. Right. I knew it wasn't Charles Gamora and his gorilla suit. That's right. And you couldn't possibly put a, a man in a dinosaur suit. That's right. But they did in that uh, remake of One Million, the, yes. the early One Million BC. That's right. And it looked so funny, you know, it looked like a refugee from a costume ball. That's right. I think the key, and you mentioned it with regards to King Kong, the key is even though you know those aren't really dinosaurs or that isn't mm -hmm. really a 50-foot gorilla, it doesn't matter if the story is compelling that's and, right. and if you're caught up in it. And that's important, that's really the be secret. caught up in the story. And that was half the charm of Kong was they took you, by the, as I mm -hmm. said, by the hand and led you into an outrageous fantasy. That's and right. you believed it. Right. Uh, by the time it was finished. And it was uh, a very rare. People today being brainwashed by television ads, they don't have the patience to see how a story builds, good storytelling. Mm -hmm. They want an explosion every five minutes. Yeah. And it, it, I, I, the type of films we made, you just couldn't uh, give that type of expression an explosion every five minutes, particularly in Greek mythology. That's right. That's right. And... Um, all of your films, regardless of what they dealt with, had compelling storylines to carry the audience. And then when your magical creatures appeared, it was just an added bonus. Yeah. You weren't just waiting for something by Harryhausen. The film was interesting all the way through anyway. And yes, then we when tried to make it that yeah, way. Yes, that's, that's, very, that's, very much so. That's why so I... Sometimes the critics... Uh, had uh, felt that our, our stories were too simple. Mm. But, you know, you can't make complicated stories uh, when you're doing a fairy tale or That's a fantasy right. film because uh, it, it just doesn't fit. That's right. So we try to make them as simple as if you were reading a child's story in a storybook. But we try to enlarge it so that we have to take sections from one uh, legend and put it in another legend mm. in order to make a, a tolerable screenplay. That's right. Even the best fairy tales, of course, were compelling, or they wouldn't have survived. They had to be compelling from yes, beginning right. to end, and the characters had to be either terrifying or humorous or a combination mm -hmm. of emotions. After the war, and you, you had some experiences doing some animation during the war, but after the war, you wanted to break out on your own. Yes. You were talented, and you knew it by then. Of course, people had been supporting you with that, but your first experience on your own was to do something for elementary schools, which today probably wouldn't have worked because of the technology. But in the 40s, after the war, after World War II, you were able to create something magical. And I've talked to people who have seen the films, the fairy tales and the mm -hmm. Mother Goose stories. One of the last, the last one you did was for the tortoise and the hare, or you started mm -hmm. that in, in the early 50s. Yes, I did. And only recently completed it with a couple of colleagues or a couple of young animators. And we are fortunate enough today to have two of the representatives from the Taurus and the Hare with us. Yes, I have the right hare here. here. Mr. Hare. Uh, this is a, a model of the hare, which uh, I think uh, you'll agree he, uh, he still holds up oh, after remarkable. 50 years. This was something you constructed back I in the early 50s. I constructed 50 yeah. years ago. Wonderful. And they had a series of heads. I made a series of heads so that they would uh, 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 have different extreme expressions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't want dialogue, so we used a, a simple music background right. for the tortoise and the hare. But for the tortoise and the hare, I, I used a narrator. Right. But you can see the heads come off, and you change to a new head and make it dissolve in the right. camera, and that changes his expression. And now, this is the, uh, uh, the fox is... Uh, another character in The Tortoise and the Hare, and he has the same uh, uh, situation with the heads. I made extreme expressions of different uh, facial movements and then dissolve from one frame to the next 
in eight frames in mm -hmm. the camera. So he's still in good condition, and the boys who finished the film found that uh, the armatures worked beautifully. And just for our audience's benefit, if you wanted to have the fox move, you'd have to move him 24 times every second. Because Absolutely, film yes. is 24 frames a second. And you have to keep the head and the arms in synchronization. So if I wanted to make him wave his hand, it would take me Yeah, if he did it slowly, time. you'd have to do it maybe in 15 frames. Mm -hmm. But if he did it fast, you'd do it in 8 frames. And you timed all this out so you knew well Oh, you have to feel it. Before yeah. you go in. Mm -hmm. And it probably became subconscious with you after a while. You just automatically oh, would, yes. would sense after when, you do how long a lot of it, it becomes subconscious. It's wonderful. You sense it rather than have to time it with a stopwatch. Your parents were incredibly supportive. Peter Jackson has said that his parents loved everything he did. Some of it was very bizarre, but they, they never said, stop what you're doing and get a real job. Well, they supported him, and obviously it's paid that's off. That's very important. I think it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And your parents were the same way. You were an only child. Your mother and father both supported you from the very beginning. They didn't hesitate. They supported you, and they said, they what, did, whatever they, you want to do. And we didn't know what the end would be. No, because this was a relatively isolated art in yes. the 40s and 50s. Willis O'Brien was still working periodically, but you were pretty much out there on your own with very few competitors or other people. Your mother made the clothing for these and the other fairy tales. Yes. Your dad, who was a machinist, did all the armatures. Right. And uh, you designed the, the characters. You designed how they looked. I designed them and yeah. animated them. It's yes. remarkable. And your parents were with you the whole time. That's that's a great story because a lot of artists, unfortunately, have parents who wonder what they're doing. I know. They want to discourage them. Discourage them. them. It's terrible. Now, in the early 50s, we actually worked with O'Brien in late 40s with Mighty Joe Young, which That's is correct. one of yes. the great examples of stop motion photography. Got an Oscar for Willis O'Brien. You did 90%. Of the work of the on animation. that. O'Brien, I was busy making the next setup. Mm -hmm. We had to keep a routine of, of setup so right. that I could go from one to the other. Finally, we got in a few other animators, but they never used any of their footage. Mm -hmm. I never saw their footage, but uh, some of them were there for quite a few weeks. And uh, uh, not one inch of their footage is in the picture. It's amazing. So uh, <clears throat> I went back and they put me back on the the famous line scene, the introduction mm -hmm. to, to uh, Mighty Joe. Where Joe comes out of the jungle for the, the first time. Where he the lion cage over. Right. And that was a big thrill. It took me three days. I did it all in one shot. And then the film editor cut it up to put the live action close-ups right, where w right. they were necessary. And that scene is still studied by special effects artists mm. as a masterpiece because it's loaded with specific things that had to be done correctly to make it all work. It mm -hmm. wasn't just Mighty Joy Young walking out on a set and moving around, mm -hmm. tabletop. No, you had, had foreground action, you had difficult. background action, you had the lion in the cage. Yeah. And certainly that was one of the landmarks of, of animation. Well, it was a, a complicated shot that Obi designed. He had uh, flowing water. Mm -hmm. He always liked to double print water in mm -hmm. the foreground to detract you from the sure. uh, criticizing the animation, That's I right. suppose. Yeah. But uh, it makes it more alive. We put birds, little animated birds, through the, uh -huh. each scene so that your eye would be det detracted. And bit. that was a bit of his trademark. He liked to do that, didn't he? Oh, yes, a lot and of, I do too. You do I, too, in your fairy tales. In all tales, my fairy did. tales, you'll see birds galore <laughs> going through the scene. Well, it adds life, and it has, I think it adds quite a bit of depth to the, it to does, the look, doesn't it, does. it, that way? After Mighty Joe Young, both you and Obi thought that people would be rapping on your door, but Which that was, it wasn't going mm -hmm. to happen. And a lot of it had to do with the way RKO handled the accounting on the movie, <clears throat> which was unfair to well, everybody. Well, they made it sound like the picture cost so much yeah. money. And it really was. Uh, and <coughs> it was budgeted for a million and a half, which was a lot in 1942 uh, yeah. or 43. Where, no, late 48. 40s, late 40s. 45. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, RKO, we were the only picture shooting for a year. Mm -hmm. And Howard Hughes just bought RKO. And uh, he was making The Outlaw, I believe, at yeah, the time. Yeah. And so they dumped all the overhead on our film yeah. of the Q 
key people in the studio, which made the picture look like it cost two million That's or right. so. That's right. Or more than that. And anybody wanting to do a special effects film would yeah, be they wary said, oh, of that. Oh, yeah. no, no, We can't no, afford no, that. No. Yeah. Oh. But you had to wait a couple more years. You did some more fairy tales in the meantime, but back in the early 50s, in 52, a young, enterprising, independent producer came to you. Yes. And uh, luckily, he had seen something you'd done. You'd shown something to him of, of your work, so he knew Well, that. I had made, uh, for a friend of his, I would made a, a Lakewood commercial. That's right. And uh, he knew Dietz was in the film business, and he uh, showed him some of the commercial animation. And uh, then uh, Jack Dietz was introduced to me, yeah. and uh, he saw some of my trick work. They were working on a script, an independent company, at a studio in Hollywood, a very inexpensive picture, low budget picture, and uh, I got trapped in the low budget uh, scene for far too long. Far too long. But it did teach me to think, how can you put a uh, spectacular image on the screen mm -hmm. without spending millions of dollars the way they do today? That's right. So it was, it really was, Despite the fact that it wasn't fair that you were caught up in a low-budget movie, it was probably an advantage to you because it forced you to create a special effect technique yes. that followed you through your entire career. And so it was really one of those strange occurrences of, uh, of needing to do something on a low budget. And mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? How can I figure this yes, out? Yes, but the one problem was that the next producer mm -hmm. who asks you to do a picture says, oh, we don't have the kind of money they have. That's right. Uh, we want you to do it for less. <laughs> so that becomes a problem. That's right. But uh, we did, uh, finally I met Charles Schneer, mm -hmm. and uh, we made uh, quite a number of pictures together over the years. And Charles we, had seen your film, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, yeah, he and saw was the film. impressed, as we all were. I was, and it was a big success. It was a huge hit. I think Warner Brothers was expecting The House of Wax to do the best business that mm -hmm. year. It was a 3D movie. It was Vincent Price. So they put all their money on that one. Yeah. And then, lo and behold, along comes your wonderful little movie, which they had purchased. Do you know what it cost? $200,000. $200, That's right. A the pittance. whole picture. The whole picture. Yes. That's one day shooting today. Uh, I know. Oh, I remember being so impressed by the film. I saw it previewed on TV. They, they didn't do previews for movies on TV no, because I television in those so. days was the enemy. Yeah. For a long time, studios stayed away. Well, they would Low-budget studios would put their movies on TV, but the major studios were afraid. Absolutely. But Warner Brothers, I think this may have been the very first movie. I could be wrong, but it was one of the first ones. Warner Brothers began putting one-minute spots of your movie on television, at least in Chicago, maybe the major markets. And I love dinosaurs, as I know you and Ray Bradbury and others have over the years. And mm -hmm. seeing those previews was magic. It was probably similar to the same sort of feeling you had when you saw King Kong. I was just taken mm -hmm. away and said, I had to see this film. Mm -hmm. It's a dinosaur movie. And like you, I was in love with the murals and the paintings of Charles Knight, and I had been seeing them in the Natural History Museum in Chicago. You had been seeing them out here on the West Coast. Yeah, uh, related to the La Brea Tar But uh, just falling in love with dinosaurs, the images of dinosaurs, those beasts actually walked the earth mm. at one time. It was fantastic. And I knew going into the movie, it was special effects of some kind. I didn't use, I didn't mm. know the term at the time. But it was absolutely amazing. And then finding out that it was done by a friend of Ray Bradbury, mm -hmm. quite a coincidence, a wonderful thing. But people are under the delusion sometimes that I worked with a big crew. Uh, Every picture I made outside of uh, Clash, of the Titans. Clash of the Titans, yeah. I, I did everything myself. Uh, I made the models, I built the sets, uh, and uh, there were, some of them were relatively simple. I finally had to get people to do uh, work like when I modeled a, a creature, uh, it, the dinosaurs had scales mm -hmm, on them, mm -hmm. which were very detailed and took a long time to do. Right. Each scale had to be put on separate. So I, I had to hire people for that. Right. But I did every inch of animation on 15 of our features. And uh, uh, I don't know, I'd hate to count the number of frames I've done. I think it would run into the millions. Oh, easily, <laughs> easily. But you had to have incredible patience and a willingness to be by yourself 
Yes. That took time. And, because that and requires concentration. Absolutely. It's not the ego of being by yourself. It's, it's the fact that if you uh, lose your concentration, for example, on the Hydra, had seven heads. And if I, I went to answer the telephone, right. I'd forget whether the third head was going forward <laughs> or backwards. And the Hydra so, was one of the major effects in, in Jason, in the, Jason Argonauts. And the Argonauts. Exactly. Yes. exactly. Speaking of that, but going back a little bit in time, back to the late 50s, after you've, you and Charles had some successes in the 50s in black and white movies, yeah. which are regarded <clears throat> as landmarks of their type, but in 1958 you released your first color movie with The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, which That's was correct. based upon one of your favorite types of storytelling, The Arabian mm -hmm. Nights. But that was based on a story of mine. That was based on a story yeah. of yours. That I tried to peddle in Hollywood three or four years before, and nobody was interested. It's remarkable. <laughs> You're looking back on it, all, this happens to everybody, I'm sure, but looking back, you say, why wouldn't anybody want to do something like that? It was so amazing. and Particularly and, when and, Howard yeah. Hughes made that film, uh, The Son of Sinbad, Son of Sinbad. <laughs> and he used a Main Street fan dancer for the lead. That's right. And uh, a cowboy for Sinbad. That's right. And uh, the film failed at the box office, and... Everybody said costume pictures yeah, were dead. They're dead. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I made eight big drawings and 20 page outline. And it, uh, finally, I, I got so discouraged, I just filed it away in my files. But then, luckily for all of us, Charles Schneer, your producer. Yes, after we made said, several books. What do you and have white. in mind? What else can you do? And he, <laughs> you went to your drawer. Well, he wanted to, uh, we wanted to get away from the monster on the loose sure, type of sure, picture. Yeah. And that was absolutely amazing. What we have here as one of our guests is... is yes, this is a skeleton from uh, Jason and the Argonauts. He was uh, uh, originally in um, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. This is the one everybody sees So I made Voyage, uh, yeah. eight more, rather six more skeletons. And you see he has every joint that a real skeleton would have. And uh, he can open his mouth. And he can it? open his mouth. Yeah, he can yeah. get different expressions. And his body moves, his arms. In each frame of film, you had to keep all these uh, appendages uh, in synchronization. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the actual skeletons that have survived. I have three others in the Berlin Museum. That's right. Fantastic. And exactly. with, along with my memorabilia. But this was the first one you created but for Seventh Voyage. But this was the Voyage. first one for the Seventh Voyage. That's wonderful. And uh, I haven't given them a name, but I will one day. Of course. <laughs> It's a classic film, and that the one scene in that film that everybody remembers is is the hero battling the skeleton. The seven skeletons. Seven. Yes, seven is a magic number in all mythology right. and in legend, and I, I felt seven skeletons would be enough to handle. In the original legend, rotting corpses come out of the ground, but we didn't want that was rather nasty, and we were afraid we were going to get an X. Mm -hmm. So we made nice, clean-cut skeletons. Well, that's probably the best choice. <laughs> the uh, attempt at a remake of Jason and the Argonauts, which was done at least over here for television, actually went back to the original source and they had the rotting, rotting corpses coming out of the ground. Yes. Absolutely, amazingly bad choice. <laughs> because, all, again, all the magic, you're, you're more concerned with being nauseated than you are yes. with... Uh, was seeing something magical. Because it's only recently that, that uh, repulsive subjects have been in demand, yeah. let us say. Yeah. Uh, in the early days, uh, I remember when the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad came to England, uh, they cut the whole skeleton sequence right. out because they were afraid it would frighten children. Mm -hmm. Today, what they have on the screen for children is remarkable. It's going to breed a whole generation of delinquents. No, we hope not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> now, along the way, you, you love Greek mythology and the Arabian Nights, of yes. course. But along the way, you also had a chance to do more with your beloved dinosaurs. And you, you uh, did at least two more films with dinosaurs. And I love the story you, tell me, you told me many times and others in audiences over the last several years. When you were in Alberta, in Calgary, you had a couple of paleontologists come up to you and tell you something. What was that? Remember yes, that? Uh, two paleontologists wrote me some years ago that uh, if it hadn't been for 1 million BC in Guangxi, they wouldn't be paleontologists. 
So I'm glad our pictures have reflected into other fields. They brought people into the film industry. Mm -hmm. They brought people into the stained glass industry. Right. They brought people into uh, uh, paleontology. And we went up to, uh, to Canada and uh, went on a dig. And I found that very tedious. They think my job was tedious, <laughs> and I think their job is tedious. <laughs> we sat for hours dusting the ground, trying to find a little bone <sighs> of some uh, dinosaur that hadn't been named yet. Uh, and I found that very tedious. But it, it, somebody has to do it, and I'm glad there's people who have patience That's to do right. that. That's right. The, um, the amazing thing is about your films is that you can learn more than just about special effects. For example, one of the things that I remember vividly about the four films that Bernard Herrmann did for you and Charles was just how amazing the music was and how it fit the stories. And that was one of the first times I became aware of how important music Oh, would music be. is a very important and you've always to been, a visual film. Absolutely, and Max Steiner's music in mm. King Kong, you've, you've spoken about this many times. But it's a Wagnerian score. It's, it's incredible. A, it's right out of opera. That's right, and it, it carries the film. The yeah. film is, it, King Kong is brilliant to begin with, with a great script, but the music just supports it. puts it, it in another yeah. dimension. And I think this is something that, again, it's, it's one of the many things that your films did that films by other people never achieved, and that is you had multiple levels in your films. You had the great stories, you had the great effects, you had the wonderful photography, often by Wilkie Cooper, your, your great collaborator. Mm -hmm. And on top of all that, you had the music, which could stand by itself, but was absolutely supportive of the film. And, this is great for film students to see. It's just, well, it uh, is. Uh, it's, uh, they, a lot of people don't realize how important music is. Mm -hmm. Today, they, they, uh, there was a period when a saxophone solo would go through the whole <laughs> <laughs> picture. Uh, and I, I know we had a strange experience on one of our films. Uh, some a pop group, I think it was, uh, contacted Charles and said, uh, we'd like to do a score for your film. We'll do it for nothing, just so we have the right to, for the recording. Mm. And uh, so our ears pricked up because we were making low budget pictures sure. do the score for nothing. And uh, he said, well, unfortunately the picture won't be able to be shown to you because a lot of it's unfinished. Oh, we don't have to see the picture. Really? They said. And they were gonna write the music and not even see the picture. So that, that put me off oh, of sure. modern scores. How could they possibly have done that? That's well, you wonder. But that's the way a lot of films are scored. It's amazing. After you started doing films overseas, you became, of course, in love with, with uh, overseas locations. With yes, Seven because Sinbad. we were looking for fresh, fresh locations. Fresh locations. What was primarily, the, the real reason for your going to England in the first place had to do with special effects, though. It wasn't just to get a different location. When you were doing The Three Worlds of Gulliver, you had to have a certain sodium backing process that well, we America had to have didn't a traveling have. Mat, traveling mat process. Uh, Hollywood yeah. specialized in rear projection. Right. And they used traveling mat occasionally, but not to any great extent. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually you saw a big broad line around the figures. And uh, Rank Laboratory in England had this wonderful sodium backing process, mm -hmm. which would make it so much easier to make big people and little people. Mm -hmm. You photograph a crowd of people from a distance, and then you superimpose them through traveling mat with Gulliver, who was photographed at close range. Exactly. Makes them look big. Mm -hmm. So that was very important for our first contact with Europe. And that then along came the idea of new location. Mm -hmm. You keep, can't keep using Grand Canyon for Lost Island. That's right. It's too yeah. well known. Yeah. Hollywood uses up all the locations in America. Mm -hmm. Too many television aerials on uh, uh, Malibu Beach, <laughs> so you can't use that for a Lost Island. But we found in Spain and Italy beautiful locations that fit fantasy films magnificently. And with at least Seventh Voyage and Jason, you had pretty much the same location, the beaches and the areas around and Spain. Mysterious and Island, Mysterious yes, Island, right. We did. 
And now they've all become tourist attractions, I understand. Hotels have been built on some of the oh, beaches. Yes. And it's just not the same. We, Jason, when we made Jason, we had to go by boat onto the, this special beach because there was no road to it. <laughs> and now, the last time, we went back to the same location uh, for Clash of the Titans. And here's a road. They bored tunnels through the rocks so they could make a road, beach umbrellas all along the, the coast. And uh, I think there was a caravan uh, where this arch we used in Jason, mm. there was a caravan uh, area for nothing but tents and caravan. So it's changed and it's a shame. And a hotel was built right. where we shot the skeleton sequence. Well, your timing was perfect on that. As, I think as it it's was, often yes. been, your timing was absolutely dead on because now you couldn't do that. You'd have to go to mm. an entirely different area and it would be probably more expensive and more difficult by oh, very much finding so. those locations. Mm. Your films, and you've said this in interviews and I've talked to you about this, your films are not director's pictures, primarily because you're really the person who dictates the overall look of the film. It's, often they were your concepts. You had storyboards or you had pre-production sketches. Talk about the role of the director with you and your films as opposed to the director usually directing customary Yes, action. they're not. Our type of picture is not a picture uh, that you would call a director's picture in the European sense of mm -hmm. the word, uh, where the director creates a, the, the whole concept. We have to create the, the concept first because of budgetary restrictions. As I said before, I had to uh, be caught in this low budget uh, situation and every uh, thing counts. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't have a lot of wasted footage by the time you're finished on the cutting room floor. So everything has to be laid out very carefully and the director's main job on our picture is to get the best out of the actors. There was even one journalist years ago who said uh, in one of his columns, he says, it's a pity Mr. Harryhausen didn't animate the actors. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. That wasn't very kind. Not very kind, but, uh, but probably I was very true. flattered. <laughs> <laughs> and you had at least two directors who, who were um, able to work with you very successfully, and primarily because they had both come out of the field of art direction. One was Nathan Duran, who was your very dear friend. That's right. And who did three films with you. And I, wasn't Don Chaffee also an art director? He was also an art director. Why, is the, why do you suppose an art director is the best choice to uh, become a director for your kind of movie? What is there about an art director, do you think? Well, they understand the technical problems yeah. more. If you get a stage director, uh, he's more interested in the dialogue, he's more interested in the camera setup. But uh, uh, art director realizes the problems I would have, so we were able to work very successfully together. But uh, we do, so occasionally you get a director where you're at odds with because of his different uh, feel for the film. And uh, I even had one director who, who tried to get me off the film because he thought I had too much say about it. And I know that Charles told him that you were the reason the film was being made. So maybe he should rethink his concerns and yes, get back but, to work, what he could do. But uh, you can understand that there's sometimes personality oh, conflicts. Sure. And, uh, but fortunately, we have worked together successfully on most of our films. Yes. And it, it must have been a lot of fun for, for most directors, except that one individual who had no. an ego problem, obviously. <laughs> but it must have been a great deal of fun because you, were, you really had to direct the actors to look at... For my sequences, For yes. invisible monsters or, or other things. And so it, it's like going back to school. I can imagine if I were directing a film that you were on, it would have been just like going back to school and learning something else that had never been taught before because mm -hmm. it's a unique situation. Yes, because uh, our, sit our s pictures, because they were unique in the way they were constructed, uh, they stand out and you, you couldn't make them in the normal course of mm -hmm. photography. The way you see it today, they spend how many millions? A yeah. uh, hundred million? I think the last picture cost 200 million. 
And I don't know where the money goes. Th you know, that's all. That would save a, a small country from bankruptcy. Well, so much of that two hundred million probably is due to the fact that the director needs to take more than one take. I mean, yes, hundreds in some cases it seems like, or at least the CGI has to be manipulated many yeah. more times. In your case, we had to make every frame count. Every frame count, and, and very seldom. Every take count, too. You seldom had a second take, even. In the animation, in the animation. I would say 95% of what you see on the screen is the first take. It's amazing. We never had time to do retakes because of the stop motion mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And you really couldn't stop if you were in the middle of something at 12 o'clock midnight. Yeah. And you were in the middle of a scene. You couldn't say, well, it's time for bed. I'll get up in the morning after breakfast and finish this. You had to finish that scene. Well, you had to at least get up to a point where, where you, you could, could cut, cut away. close up. Yeah. And that's why I, the storyboarding, uh, I would make these big key sketches to show the actors what they were up against. Mm -hmm. And those would be published in the script. And then I also made about 400 little sketches for each of my sequences so that we could judge where a close-up could possibly come mm -hmm. because you can't have a long scene and expect uh, to, to have it go the way you want it to go. Right. So, and we also, doing low-budget pictures in the early days, had to compromise. And there are a lot of compromises, and I, when I see some of the films, I shudder if I'd only taken a little more time or if the weather had been better. <laughs> When in, uh, even in Clash of the Titans, when we had a bigger budget, uh, we had a situation where the cast had to go to uh, another country in mm. a, a private plane. And uh, so they left me behind to do my shots in the rain, the scorpion sequence. But uh, we overcame it by various means and uh, uh, somehow, but we, had, we never had the time or the money to wait for a cloud to come in the right place or a, right. Uh, the situation normally. And a lot of actors, it was amazing too, they didn't want to take back seat to special effects. No. They didn't want to, I think there was an old tradition, don't uh, uh, get onto a picture where there's a dog or a child mm -hmm. or something like that, an old cliche. But uh, then special effects came in. They don't want to take a back seat to a dummy. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you'd classify these as dummies. <laughs> <laughs> well, some actors' careers, being in your films, probably helped. I think Because so. it got them some attention. It certainly did. Well, one of the things that is so impressive about your career, and I think most people uh, would be interested in knowing this, the majority, probably the vast majority of special effects artists in the business today look back on your films as the reason that they're in the business. Yes, and, I do. And we're talking about... Virtually everybody at ILM, George mm -hmm. Lucas's facility, and spin-offs from that, Phil Tippett, who did the wonderful designs for the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, and makeup people like, special makeup people like Rick Baker and Stan mm -hmm. Winston, all these individuals, and I've been with you when they've come up to you, so I know it's not just storytelling. Mm -hmm. All of them, thank you for getting them in the business. Well, that's, I'm grateful that's that remarkable. they've taken it a little further than I took it. Well, it's, it's such a, a tribute to you because... I, mean, I know when you were working, you, you had no idea what influence you may or may not have been having. Absolutely not. And it wasn't no. until you probably retired or you were near retirement that you began getting mm. the idea that you had influenced more than one generation, probably at this time over two generations Well, of I'm people. glad we've influenced them in a positive way. Absolutely. Because Charles and I tried to make pictures that had an upbeat. We wanted to keep the hero a hero and mm -hmm. not an anti-hero. Right. Right. We wanted to make the villain get his comeuppance. And, and uh, sometimes people say that's cliche, but, you know, give me a fresh cliche. We've yeah. got a lot of fresh cliches. Yeah. Well, cliches have to begin somewhere, <laughs> and they usually begin with a truthful yes. treatment of something. And I think yeah. film was made, uh, fantasy cannot be expressed in a better way than on film because it's so flexible, particularly today with CGI. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, with CGI, uh, we're inundated with it. Uh, it. It's been brought down to the mundane. Mm -hmm. People 
uh, see the most amazing images in a 30 second commercial. So they're no longer amazed when they see something right. amazing on the screen, which I think is a little p uh, pathetic because, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, as they say. Well, it's one more tool, as you've said, and uh, it's a it, tool. It may eventually yes. become something other than that. It may be refined to the point where it's as entertaining as your films were. But they give the impression that everything else is old-fashioned, mm -hmm. should be discarded. Right. And look at Ardman. They brought back the puppet film. With Chicken Run. With Chicken yeah. Run. Right. And they're doing some other marvelous things with Creature Comfort. They had Wallace and Gromit. And the great Wallace carrots, and Gromit. Yeah. And uh, there are companies in America, uh, Will Vinton up in Seattle, mm -hmm. who do commercials and right. various things. So puppet films are not dead. But nobody else has attempted the type of film we made, That's where right. you have a leading character who is an animated model, Excellent. like King Kong. And I bless O'Brien for establishing that. He made stars out of dinosaurs for The Lost World. How many people remember the cast of The Lost World, but they remember the dinosaurs? And you've made stars out of skeletons. Yes, I'm grateful for that. And <laughs> in your last film, before you retired, at least from motion pictures. You haven't retired from the art world. Yes. But in your last film, Clash of the Titans, you've made a star out of... Medusa. Medusa. I had, I'd always wanted to animate a Medusa. Now, she's a lovely creature. And this is the model yeah. of Medusa, which was uh, uh, made for Clash of the Titans. Yes. Uh, she's a different... I did a great deal of research for Medusa. I... I uh, some of the classic concepts just showed a, a woman with a pretty face mm -hmm. with snakes in her hair. Right. I, for our dramatic purposes, I wanted to make it uh, much more dramatic, melodramatic. So we gave her a very uh, a serpentine body so I wouldn't have to animate clothing because gosmic gowns are very difficult to animate. Exactly. And we didn't want dialogue, so we, uh, we uh, gave her a rattlesnake's tail to account for her presence hmm. uh, and in the sound effect. Right. And then we gave her the, the bow and arrow of Diana, right. the huntress. So we mixed a little bit of the mythology together in order to create this type of character. And this scene is probably one of your greatest scenes. It's, it's nice that it's in the last film you saw released mm -hmm. because it's so intricate with all the snakes in the hair yes. and the rattle and the way you lit it, it's, it's a remarkable mm. scene. And I tried to use what I call the Mildred Pierce lighting because I was always impressed by Joan Crawford's uh -huh. uh, wonderful portrayal of Mildred Pierce. The way they lit her, she would come into shadow, mm -hmm. into light from shadow, and go out again. And I tried to accomplish that with Medusa. It's remarkable. And I think along with the skeleton sequence in Jason and the other one in Seventh Voyage and some of your dinosaur footage, film students who are interested in effects look to this scene as a model mm -hmm. because it doesn't get any better than this. This is the mm -hmm. best it can be. And well, anybody you. trying to imitate you is certainly mm -hmm. challenging themselves quite a bit. It's just beautiful. One of the things I've, I've found most interesting about your career, in addition to the, the fact that so many special effects artists are influenced or have been influenced by you and owe you so much, is that directors like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and James Cameron have also indicated a great debt to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were getting your star on the Walk of Fame last year, we had letters from them congratulating you and, oh, yes. and uh, thanking you. It's nice to know that you're not just influencing one f part of the film industry. Yes. It's, it's, it's the, the power in the industry. And it must be a great feeling to know that you have had so much influence in the right places. You've started mm. so many people on their careers and you've had such an incredible influence on and young talent. It certainly talent. wasn't intentional in the first place. <laughs> the main object when we made pictures was to get the thing made on the screen. I was uh, uh, very distressed by Willis O'Brien uh, having such problems. He did so many wonderful mm -hmm. uh, basic ideas and sketches right. and even got up to a semi-production stage and then the picture was canceled the War Eagles, on yeah. Guanji, on, on a number of pictures. So I've been very lucky and I'm grateful for that. 
Well, you've been very lucky um, yourself, but we've been very lucky, mm -hmm. all of us. My generation and the generation involved with the taping of this program has been very lucky because they've been able to see your films mm -hmm. and they've been able to learn from your films mm -hmm. and they've been able to enjoy your films, which is something we can't always say today. Mm -hmm. Watching your films over and over mm -hmm. is not a problem for most people. Well, if anyone. I'm glad to see that. Over and over. <laughs> and now we have DVDs, we have tapes. Thank and God so. for laser disc DVDs and all uh, the wonderful technical things. But again, I think uh, the advance of technical era uh, has sort of diminished the concept of wanting a story. Mm -hmm. uh, so many pictures my wife and I see on television and on the screen. We don't go to films much anymore. You don't know what they're trying to tell you. Yeah. They're just a series of happenings or explosions. And uh, it's very seldom you see a story that I find comprehensible. No, I feel the same way. It, it's, mm. uh, it's missing. In many cases, yes. you have so a lot of So you can't flash, yeah. neglect the storyline. After all, that's the basic uh, principle of any form of technical prowess is to uh, put... A, a good story on the screen. Absolutely. And that's what we tried to do. Well, I want to thank you for not only being with us today, but for being my friend. We've been thank friends you. for a few years. You were a hero to me, and it's always nice to be able to say to your hero, Well, you certainly you. aided in, in making the public aware of our, our type of film, and I'm most grateful for that. Thank you. And thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next time on In the Credits. Mm -hmm.